which is the annual landmark event of the Department of Economics. This year, the court youth activities, which includes this armchair discussion and the debate competitions, both the secondary and tertiary, will be conducted on three days via the virtual platform. The theme for this year's activities, Crisis is Opportunity, COVID-19, The Way Forward, is centered on the belief that with every situation, there is an opportunity for growth and healing. For us at the Department of Economics, it is of vital importance that the youth are involved and their perspectives on issues are heard and those issues may affect them now and in the future. This forum provides an opportunity to explore authentic youth engagement which can benefit participants on a personal level as well as in their communities. Utilizing meaningful youth participation can contribute to adequately addressing their needs and interests through structured programs and policies. It is our hope that you enjoy and actively participate through our discussions to, in today's events and we look forward to your continued support and participation. I would now like to welcome the head of our Department of Economics, Dr. Darren Conrad, to bring a few welcome remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roxanne. Um, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Economics, we'd like to extend a very warm welcome to uh, the panelists, uh, to the members of the media, as well as the audience. I am indeed honored to welcome all of you to this Youth Armchair Discussion, one of the most important events uh, uh, in the department which surrounds the court activities. I am always heartened when I see a panel of youth uh, such as yourselves. I am really, really um, delighted to be here to share this experience with you all. One of the main reasons I am always heartened is because I am always certain that with the youth that we can count on comments that are imbued with fresh idealism and ingenuity, which is always tempered in reality, which is always very refreshing to hear. And again, a warm welcome to you all, and I look forward to hearing all of you from, from all of you all this afternoon as the evening as the afternoon proceeds. Uh, again, welcome. Thank you. Roxanne, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Conrad. I would now like to welcome Ms. Rakaya Scott, who is the president of the Economic Society of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, to bring a few brief remarks. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, to all of our speakers, our viewing audience, and members of staff, and obviously the media, welcome. And my name is Rukai, and I'm very happy to be here and very happy to bring greetings on behalf of the Economic Society. In fact, today we actually have two representatives from the Economic Society that will be part of this youth armchair discussion, and it's something that we're very, very excited about. Um, as a young person myself, I'm always super excited to see discussions like this, where we have young people talking about all different topics um, across the sphere that we can even imagine in economics. So I look forward to the discussion and I just want to encourage everyone who's viewing in to ask your questions and enjoy the conversation. And I, I have no doubt that today is going to be a great one. So thank you. All right, thank you, Rakaya. Let me take this opportunity to introduce the moderator of this afternoon's event, Mr. Darian Narine. Darian Narine was born in Trinidad and Tobago, but considers himself a global citizen and a youth advocate. Darian holds a BSc in psychology with a minor in theater arts from the University of the West Indies. During his time on campus, he has served on the UE Guild of Students in capacity as president, vice president, and national affairs chairperson. 
He is currently pursuing a Master's of Arts in Cultural Studies and is a National Youth Award recipient for leadership from the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Darian serves on various international, regional, and national committees in different capacities, including as vice chairperson for inclusion and engagement on the Commonwealth Youth Council and the chairman of the task force for the Commonwealth Youth Forum to be held in Rwanda. He is a born member on the Global Coalition for Youth Employment under the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs and the Chancellor's Commission on Governance for the University of the West Indies. Darren is also the Director of Planning and Development for the Youth Vote Matter, Matter Campaign and the founder of RACE, a campaign that deals with race and race relations across the Caribbean. Darren is a communications and public relations specialist, cultural advocate, performer, and entrepreneur who advocates for regionalism. His hobbies include swimming, hiking, dragon boating, running, networking, and reading. He strongly believes in the power of education as a tool of progression and an advocate for youth involvement and energy in issues affecting them. We welcome you, Darian, and we thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. St. Martin, for that amazing introduction. Um, I'm, I'm so happy. And, and for those of you all, I don't know if you all know Dr. St. Martin, but the kind of work that she does in the Department of Economics with the entire team as well is quite phenomenal. I've, while I served on, on the Guild of Students, I remember people oftentimes singing her praises and also Dr. Conrad's praises as well. So I'm really happy that, um, that we got opening remarks from them and of course from the President of the Economics Society as well, Rakaya Scott. So welcome to Court uh, Conference on the Economy. This is the youth session that we're going to be entering into right about now the youth armchair discussion. And we have some phenomenal, fabulous, spectacular young people who are on board and who are going to be joining us here this evening on the panel. And I'm really happy to welcome them. And I, what I like as well is that the Department of Economics has taken it upon themselves to not only include students of the university, but also students with, from secondary school as well, who I think have excellent contributions and important contributions to bring to the table, which just shows how much they are planning for the continuity in terms of, of economic strength in, in that field um, going forward. It's always great to hear from young minds across the board uh, of all ages, of all varying ages and of all varying walks of life. But without further ado, I'm going to uh, just let you all know who we have on the panel here this evening, this afternoon rather, sorry. Um, so we have Miss Bridget Gopal, we have Mr. Esalon, Mr. Esalon Dimont, we have Ambika Pabaru, we have Dominique Alyssa Laurent, and we have Joshua Pegas, who will be with us here this evening on the panel. And I'm going to go into their, their introductions and their bios, which is quite vast for young people as well. But uh, let's go to our first panelist and I'm going to introduce her now for you all. Um, and her name is, of course, Miss Bridget Gopal. And Bridget Rose Gopal is an undergraduate student pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Economics with a minor in Finance at the University of the West Indies. She was the co-founder of the Australian Mathematics Olympiad Club at Holy Faith Convent, Coover, and served as president for four years. Currently, she's the assistant PRO of the Economics Society of the UE and is a youth advocate, Trinidad and, Trinidad and Tobago Youth Advocacy Network. Her advocacy is centered around greater investment in innovation, infrastructure, and national institutional reformation. Her goal, is, her goal is to contribute to the field of applied economics and, it has a, and she has a keen interest in data journalism. So I'm really happy that, um, you know, Bridget will be, will be kicking us off here this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the ball over to, an, an, I guess, a youth expert in her own right, uh, Miss Bridget Gopal. 
Thank you so much, Darren, for that introduction. And before I proceed, I would just like to extend a thank you to Dr. Conrad, Dr. St. Martin, and Ms. Rakaya Scott, and everyone at the Economic Society for having me on this panel this afternoon. Now, without further ado, let's get started. The coronavirus pandemic has brought nations' vulnerabilities to the forefront. There has been the threat of widespread food shortages, historically high unemployment rates, and the gig, econ the gig economy can reasonably be described as non-existent. Thus, the coronavirus pandemic has been an eye-opener for nations. But with the, but it has also presented an opportunity to forge a new path, a new and more sustainable path. It gives us a chance to dispense old, tradition, old traditions and paradigms and adopt a new, more innovative and adopt a new, more innovative route. Financial technology has finally gotten its day in the sun because it has because the coronavirus pandemic has sent us into a scavenger hunt for solutions. The education system has now gone completely digital and our healthcare system, due to the extensive strain, can now take up telemedicine and tele telepsychiatry in order to alleviate said strains. With regards to financial technology, it brought me great joy to see in the recent budget presentation that our government opted to go, go in the route of e-identity cards and e-payment service through the implementation of the National Single Electronic Window, TT BizLink, which upon implementation will ease the processing times for businesses. These new strides, which are in direct alignment with policy recommendations made in 2015 by Amchan CEO Nira Tiwari, were a gross oversight to have not been implemented before the pandemic hit. No matter the political stewardship we were under, infusing these initiatives will bring greater efficiency, better accessibility, and higher degree of transparency of our government institutions. Now, where there's a potential for good, there's always a potential for bad. It is the inevitable yin and yang of our everyday lives. As a result of the digitalization, the protection of digital assets as well as the protection of digital aspects, as well as the opportunity for criminals to disrupt business opera opera operations have also arose. In order to combat both individuals and companies would have to opt for more cybersecurity and privacy practices. Furthermore, with the electrification of our society, the education system can undergo uh, re much needed reconstruction. Our traditional system is centered around a teacher who calls out notes and students who, in true testing, regurgitates information. We can now center our education curriculum around more auditory and visual learners that may have otherwise not been included inside economy in our education system and be left behind. They can do so through diagrams and maps and YouTube videos uh, uh, using these BBC and Zoom platforms. Another, another area which technology has the potential to revolutionize would be our healthcare sector. Telemedicine and telepsychiatry can now take its rightful place in said sector. We all know here at Trinidad and Tobago the, um, the immense lines and, in, and strains that we would face when going to these public institutions before the pandemic hit, yet alone now when we have, it is overwhelmed and these facilities are unable to scale up their services in order to meet the great demand. Telemedicine, can, telemedicine and virtual consultations can ease these strains on the healthcare system and telepsychiatry has the potential to reduce our residual unemployment within the region. Regionally, 
regionally, countries have been forced to take a step back away from globalization. And in doing so, we have had the threat of widespread food shortages. Our food import bill for 2019 amounted to a ballpark figure around TT4 billion to TT6 billion dollars. While there may never be a situation where we can entirely feed ourselves with no imports, it presents us with the opportunity and through proper acquisition and implementation of unmanned aerial vehicles that, that can ease the lives of farmers and in, act as an incentive for more youth involvement within the agriculture sector. Financial institutions and financial technology can also partner with agribusinesses in order to mitigate risks in lending and launch a wider set of affordable financial services for smallholders. Smallholder knowledge can also be improved through the digitalization of databases and, and service distribution channels. At this point in time, I hope that it is clear to see that the digitization of our economy is not an inapplicable notion or an uh, unattainable dream. It is a reality moving forward. It is a compulsory component for our economy. If we wish not only to survive the pandemic, but thrive off of it. It has also, it can also act as a catalyst agent for the, sustain, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In particular, SDG 7. Clean and, afford, clean and affordable technology, technology. In some Latin American and Caribbean countries such as Jamaica, Haiti, Panama, and Mexico, 10, more than 10 percent of their population still does not have access to cooking technologies. A long-term focus on the electrification of technologies for cooking purposes will help to alleviate these strains and these access to, technol to technology. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, the UN and the, the UN, DP and the European Union have supported Trinidad and Tobago's transition into a more digitalized and more energy efficient economy with a project that has the potential to not only diversify the economy, but define, the green, define our green economy. The, pr the promotion of energy efficient, efficiency will reap benefits on our economy in the form of the competitiveness of said economy and the improvement in productivity levels. Another SEG which will be brought to the forefront and more and through our budget presentation sees that there will be more attention paid is SEG 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. In our, in our finance minister's budget presentation, uh, in our finance minister's budget presentation, there was a mention of the Central Statistical Institute moving to become the National Statistical in Central Statistics Officer, moving towards the National Statistical Institute which was a suggestion that was made uh, during May 2020 by Dr. Senior Lecturer, Dr. Raju Hussein, in an interview he gave with Loop News in May 2020. Nevertheless, the coronavirus pandemic has dampened the progress in other SDGs, such as SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, SDG, the first SDG, No Poverty, SDG 2, Zero Hunger, and SDG 5 gender equality with the arising of the shadow pandemic, violence against women and girls. Nevertheless, in conclusion, the pandemic bestows onto us an opportunity to make significant strides towards a more technological and innovative economy. It exposes the inequality and gaps in society, but through financial technology and, diverge, and diverging resources, towards bridging the gap by sometime, by maybe robbing Peter to pay for Paul in the way we direct our revenues. Hopefully we can emerge out of this time with permanent systematic changes, more sustainable practices and higher levels of cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget, for that, for that um, insight, of course, on the digitalization process 
And I thought that you, you raised some very important and key points inside there, um, specifically with, with digimedicine is an area that I've been uh, very interested in over the last um, you know, couple, couple of years. And so, so I'm happy that you raised that. So expect a few questions on that as soon as we go to the question and answer section. Nevertheless, um, I'm going to move over to our next panelist, who's Mr. Esolon Dumont. And Esolon Dumont is an undergraduate student pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Economics at the University of the West Indies. He's passionate about economics, politics, law, and agri agriculture, with a vivid interest in human and sustainable development. Esolon believes that human development should be the priority of a nation, as no nation can achieve real growth and development if we do not invest in the minds of the people. His goal is to become an eminent economist that can make a significant contribution to economics at the domestic, regional, and international level. So we're going to hand over now to Esalon, and I know that he's going to um, have a very interesting and intriguing presentation for us here this afternoon as well. Thank you, Darian, for that warm introduction. And good afternoon to everyone tuned in, and thank you for being here. I want to express my gratitude to the department and on the Economic Society for the opportunity as I will be speaking on agriculture. Firstly, from observations of past budgets, agriculture has always been quote unquote, the black sheep. The sector has always been left out and no real attention has been invested in it. The implementation deficit for the sector grows immensely with each fiscal year that passes by. In the 2020 budget presentation, the sector received an allocation of $831 million. However, for 2021, the sector was awarded a 70% increase amounting to $1.198 billion. With the hopes of achieving sustainable food security and the aim of reducing a high import bill. The topic of diversification has always been brewing in many conversations, but no real action was taken. Sadly, it took a pandemic for us to realize the reality before us which is invigorating the fact that we have to navigate new avenues of sustainable revenue streams. Economic growth is the objective of every government, but how can we achieve economic growth if there is no sustainable thinking? Governments tend to have short-term thinking of five years and what they can accomplish in that specific time frame. And when I say governments, I'm not referring to any political party, but those who were elected to work within the halls of power. This year, the government took a step in the right direction with the aim of alleviating our food import bill. However, it was definitely a step too slow. The security of food and its production received some focus as the COVID-19 revealed the vulnerability of the country. So how does the sector ignite the engine for growth? Creativity and innovation. And I, I assure you, once it is employed, the market will do the rest. And it's simple as that. Agriculture is very arduous to work, but with innovation and technological improvements, it becomes very easy. I think the problem with agriculture is that individuals fear the commitment. They are under the impression that agriculture is backbreaking work. And I want to discourage that thinking because it, also, it is only difficult if you make it difficult. In addition to that, think about the health benefits of planting your own food. You instantly give yourself the assurance that it's organic and you can consume it with comfort knowing that it's free from chemicals. I'm urging young entrepreneurs with an interest in agriculture to adopt creative thinking, innovation, and incorporate digitalization and employ them in your agricultural journey, as this will make the cultivation process much easier. For example, utilizing water saving technologies, which will address the issue of water shortages in the period of dry spells. I know that, I know that a hot topic in agriculture is hydroponics, which is also a good initiative, but when it comes to the implementation and the setting up stage, I think that is the downturn of it, because not everyone has the knowledge and the resources to install a hydroponic system. And this is where education, agriculture education is important. We need to modernize programs to teach these concepts. In terms of export initiatives, we keep talking about the cultivation process, but I'm not hearing about the manufacturing side of it. Let's talk about that. Yes, we planted the crops. Yes, we have reaped the crops, but why aren't we addressing the need for agricultural manufacturing? By providing a quality and efficient product, we can possibly decrease imports for certain goods. But as a people, we love imports because we believe that every foreign thing is better than what we produce locally. And I believe, and I have to be real with this, down to bananas, we are importing from Dominica. And the truth of the matter is that it's not even bananas or the gummy shell that we are accustomed to, it's lacatan. 
and we need to have some level of consciousness of what we are consuming. So the objective is to decrease our food import bill. But how are we going to do that? I believe we have to look at the commodities that we import and work with local farmers, farmers to develop that collaboration um, to produce that what we import. And I'm not saying that we have to cultivate apples, strawberries, kiwis, but cultivate crops that can actually grow here. And as it relates to entrepreneurship, we need to work with local businesses to improve their capacity and obtain international market access, as this has potential for growth, which will increase exports, generate employment, provide opportunities, and of course, boost GDP. As it relates to the cocoa and coffee industry, we have been ranked as having one of the world's finest cocoa with its own unique name, Trinitario, which is quite commendable. Reinvigorating this industry will open a floodgate of opportunities as Trinbegonians, and also as Trinbegonians, we have a hot mouth, but another thing we have hot too is that scorpion pepper, one of the world's hottest pepper. Why haven't we shared and developed a market for it? Muruga Hill Rice is another avenue to generate foreign exchange, and it's not going to happen overnight. Diversification takes time. It's not a very quick process, but I'm trusting that we start the process now. We know that food security is an issue, but as youths, we want the assurance of job security also. The minister confidently used words to impress us, the youth, but we don't want to be just impressed. We want to see action. Nelson Mandela once said, the youth of today are leaders of tomorrow. But I believe that our youths are leaders of today because we can't have the discussion of sustainable development and exclude the youth because sustainable, sustainable development is development that deals with future generations and perspectives must come from the youth. Agriculture entrepreneurship, or I should merge it to and say agropreneurship, is a key sector that can drive the country's GDP as creativity enhances the possibilities of business development, capitalizing on opportunities and income generation. The factors of production is the key ingredient in the recipe for business success. And if one of the components that builds the factors of production, in this case, land, and we all know that land tenure is a concern for many because the process is too long and why business owners should invest in an asset without having the assurance that it's theirs. And why should this be? We have so many idle forested state lands. Shouldn't this speed the process up? And I know that there are requirements in obtaining these lands, but why is the process so convoluted? Is it that our systems are ancient and need to be restructured to, restructured to meet the demands of the digital economy? So the real question is, are we really promoting agropreneurship? To me, it's definitely a solid no. Shipping gears to predialacine. Predialacine seems to be a big problem that is quite prevalent in this time. I've seen recent articles where farmers have defended their crops because in my opinion, predialacine receives little or no attention. And I strongly believe that we need to dialogue on the conversation of safeguarding the farmers as they embark on their agricultural journey because we can't expect farmers to enter an industry without giving them the assurance that yes, there are consequences for individuals to tamper with your crop. And to highlight also, we should look at land security and use technology to our advantage. For example, a device can divide the bonds and when it's breached, you instantly receive a notification. And this could help catch the culprits. Because you see, Predia last name is very funny. Because if someone stole your Zaboka from your tree and you know that is the person who stole it, you can't accuse them without presenting solid evidence because there's no way for you to say that how Yes, that was your Zaboka that they stole. In the presentation, the Minister of Finance said, and I quote, we can no longer tolerate a high food import bill. Agriculture will remain a tax-free industry and we will make it more attractive to young people. A $500 million agriculture stimulus package will be made available, end of quote. The real question associated with this is how do we get youths involved? It is a challenge. Some will say employ various instruments and social platforms, but I will disagree. Before we address the issue on how to promote agriculture, we must first address the issue on how to shift from traditional thinking. And I say traditional thinking in the sense that agriculture is still seen and viewed as a low level job. It is, and it is generally accepted that agriculture is for quote unquote uneducated people. The truth of the matter is that it's not. Our youth is playing a vital role in the diversification process. But how do we change the mindset to get youth involved? This is where successful farming comes in. Because we can't expect youth to enter and invest in something that is not booming. I don't know how many of you recall the time where something simple as ginger, the price was astronomically high. I think it was $50 a pound. And it's funny because everyone realized the profits being generated from ginger and everyone cultivated ginger. 
with hopes to enjoy the high profits. But the market forces demand and supply did not allow it because competition kept the prices of ginger down. And this is how individuals tend to operate. Once they observe that a certain agricultural commodity generates high profits, they will enter. So I think we should scrutinize on the agriculture market to understand where the profits are. Another initiative that the government can possibly look into is exposing agriculture to the youth. So it could work like this. You target which level you think that will be, it will help the most. Let's say form four, form five. And you have a collaboration with big farms and you provide internships for them through these farms during the two month vacation as many of them is actively searching for a summer job. And this, uh, so the, this will work because not only they are, they are learning in the process, but they are also earning a stipend. And, and I believe, and according to Whitney Houston, and she once said that, I believe that the children are the future, teach them when and let them lead the way. And quite frankly, I share the same sentiment. And in closing, I can think of no better way than to close in the words of the former British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. I thank you. Thank you so much for that, Esalon. Um, I thought I raised some very pertinent points inside there, of course, around the agricultural sector. And I, um, I, one, one specific area that I was, I was very interested in was a point that you raised um, around, of course, the successful, we need to have a successful planning model in place to get more youth involved in the agriculture sector. So I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to you explaining a little bit more what the structure of that economic model will look like um, and how it's going to, to benefit everybody inside there. Nevertheless, um, I'm going to move on to the next presenter. And this is Ambika Pabaru. Uh, Ambika Pabaru is an upper six student at the Swaha Hindu College who's passionate about business and economics and hopes to use this passion to become an entrepreneur. Ambika hopes to one day work in the educational sector since she believes sharing knowledge and molding minds is critical to the successful development of a country. Ambika enjoys public and motivational speaking and uses this particular, particularly in the area of mental health. So we're very happy to have Ambika on board here from Swaha. Um, Ambika, I'm going to hand over to you now to hear your thoughts on, of course, this here, um, at this here armchair um, discussion under court. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction, Darian. Um, so yeah, I was presenting on labor. So in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, in regards to labor, we saw an increase in unemployment and a decrease in working hours. Various social and safety nets have been introduced in order to basically cushion the economic effects that have been faced. Regardless of this, the question still remains as to how much can we really depend on this? And if we can, for how long? These are the important questions that we have to ask and really look at and pay attention to. Because it's not economically reasonable to depend on government-based grants and not be earning or making an effort to earn an income for yourself. In order to encourage the labor force to continue functioning, we have also seen various online programs that opportunity to learn new skills or in some instances enhance skills that they already process, possess. The idea behind these programs is to allow people who have lost jobs or who need to earn more money due to wage decreases to now be equipped with the mindset and necessary skills to be able to maintain their standard of living despite the difficult economic period. This has really given rise to entrepreneurship, especially in the Caribbean region. This is very important because if people don't make an effort to support themselves, the overall standard of living will decrease. And if the standard of living decreases in the long term, it will lead to a rise in poverty in society. Especially at this time where the price of basic necessities are on a constant rise. We seem to just have, uh, have some, a few technical difficulties there on Ambika's side. You know that these things do happen. Um, and I was just getting into her presentation. I mean, it was quite, quite um, interesting. And, and we know that youth unemployment, of course, is at a very high level as well. So I know that, um, that we will go back to her in just a few. So we'll go back to Ambika in just a few, as soon as she's um, back on board with us. But for now, I'm gonna move on to the next panelist. 
and that is Dominique Alyssa Laurent. And Dominique Alyssa Laurent is a 17 year old upper six student of the Swaha Hindu College. She is currently studying management of business, economics, and visual arts. It is her hope to continue her studies in the arts in arts at the University of the West Indies with the ultimate dream of becoming an art therapist. So without further ado, I'll hand you all over right now to Dominique Alyssa Laurent. Hi, thank you for the um, warm welcome. And um, I'll be talking on the arts and culture sector. Um, the creative and cultural sectors are important in their own right um, in terms of employment, economic contributions, as well as contributions to other channels for positive social impact. However, in observing the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the arts and culture sector, it can be seen that unfortunately it has suffered tr tremendously becoming one of the other affected sectors to receive the hardest hits among, um, amongst the sectors, according to analysts. Especially in the beginning of the um, stages of the pandemic, we saw how various events um, such as the Calabash Literary um, Festival in Jamaica and the Bocas Lit Fest in Trinidad and Tobago were affected with these events having to be postponed um, whilst some others were being cancelled. Um, the arts and culture sector feels employs thousands of workers with the Caribbean economy having such strong ties to tourism, including cultural tourism. We can see how this sector would have been heavily impacted. However, despite the pandemic and the level of uncertainty, uncertainty and difficulties accompanying it, we've all bear witness to how the creative and cultural sectors were able to maneuver themselves and create opportunities that we never thought would have been possible. Due to the social distancing measures, um, online platforms, content, online content platforms profited from the increased demand for cultural content streaming. Many individual artists and organizations began to develop new and creative ideas to promote themselves, considering the unexpe unexpected change to their business model, allowing them the opportunity to explore avenues of technology to create virtual and digital exhibitions, performances, and other events. It could, this could possibly change the future of the arts and culture sector post pandemic as individuals and organizations may continue to create and find ways to include technology in their works and events to further inclusivity and reach a wider audience. We may also, we may also see a change in media within artworks as opposed to the traditional works we usually see in Caribbean art, um, or quite possibly a fusion between the two. With the continuous growth in the sector as well, um, despite the pandemic, we can see how the sector has contributed to other sectors with um, authors having, providing access to free online textbooks and other resources. This has allowed for um, the increase in access to resources for students and aiding in their educational growth. We also seen how due to the pandemic, the labor and tourism sectors were affected, in turn affecting the culture sector as well. With the cultural, with cultural tourism being one of the largest and fastest growing global tourism markets, with the, and with the cultural and creative industries being used to promote destinations, the development of virtual tour guides and digital events were created and made available to the general public, thus allowing some individuals to possibly retain their jobs um, within the sector. The creative sector has also contributed to mental health awareness 
um, during the pandemic, joining hands with the health sector to develop methodologies and solutions for individuals to preserve their mental health, um, especially during the social isol isolation stages at the beginning of the pandemic using art as a form of therapy to relax the mind and relieve individuals from stress which they may have faced during the quarantine. Um, though the arts and culture sector has accelerated in terms of digital digitalization um, and has created new niches for up and coming individuals in pursuit of job positions in this sector, it is important to keep in mind that they, these are merely advancements made, being made. It is highly unlikely that these experiences would take away or fully replace the traditional forms. Um, Post-pandemic, youths and other, pursuing, other persons pursuing um, positions in this sector would have a, great, a greater opportunity to take these new inventions created during the pandemic and build on it, hopefully, working towards creating a more efficient future. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you so much, Dominique, uh, for that, for that um, conversation around arts and culture. And of course, for those of you all who know me, know that arts and culture and that sector in specific, as well as tourism is very near and dear to my heart. So I will, will have some personal questions, uh, very, very personal questions <laughs> that I'll be pitching to you as well. Um, so I just want to take this, take this opportunity right now to probably just attack back to Ambika and to check and see if she's, if she's ready for us there to finish up a presentation on labor, which was rather insightful and began rather well. Um, so I'm hoping that, that she's here with us and that she can continue that presentation for us. Ambika? Yes, sorry, I'm here, I'm here. Okay, great, so we're hearing you loud and clear. So please um, continue on with, with your presentation. Great. So in the instance where employees who would have been laid off from their jobs and whatnot, some of them decided to become entrepreneurs and open their own businesses. And as a result of doing this, in addition to being their own boss, they are now able to spend more quality time with their children and in extension, their wider family. In order for countries to be able to survive, remain afloat and recover during and post COVID-19, entrepreneurship is key. The youth of the Caribbean have also come to realize this and they now know that they should be putting taught into moving away from the traditional sectors and moving into sectors such as agriculture, which would contribute to the, to the diversification of the economy. And we also see that the government of TNT has acknowledged this, where in the 2020 budget, $1.1 billion, an average of $1.1 billion was allocated to agriculture. Now this money is expected to be put into pretty last name, to put, be put into a sector that would sort of take care of that, which would sort of control that. Um, it's also thought to be put into like subsidies on certain agricultural products to basically encourage people to join the agricultural sector because they have now come to realize that this is the way forward. This is the future of Trinidad and Tobago. We're now moving away from an oil and natural gas based economy to agricultural based economy. And the youth are now seeing this firsthand that they are gaining access to financial assistance from the government is difficult and they need to work a little harder to, to secure their, their future financially, especially now taking into consideration that we are looking at social distancing and the implementation of healthcare guidelines being the new normal in society. The government, due to COVID-19, now have had the opportunity to see where they would have made various mistakes in creating policies and they now have the chance to amend these errors so that in the event of another pandemic, they would be better prepared and equipped with knowledge and policies to know how to handle the economy and keep it afloat while simultaneously managing the country's labor force by allowing for job security to be achieved. Thank you, Darian. Thank you, Ambika, uh, for finishing up and wrapping up there for us as well on that presentation on labor. Um, 
and uh, you know, youth unemployment is also a, a very pressing issue at the moment within Trinidad and Tobago, especially during this pandemic and this COVID-19 pandemic specifically. Yeah? Um, so it's important that, that we also uh, take an examination and a look at that. So expect some questions around that, Ambika, uh, as, we, as we move over to the last panelist, who is Joshua Pegas. Joshua Pegas is a lower six student at Queens Royal College. He's currently pursuing Spanish, French, and MOB in hopes of becoming a lawyer, interpreter, and business owner. He's very passionate about languages as it opens up new opportunities and portrays a different vision of life. Joshua enjoys doing spoken word and public speaking, which motivates him to pursue a career in law and advocate for a better future for his generation. He's a very outgoing person and is always willing to try new things and ideas. So I'm going to hand over to Joshua. Joshua, ¿qué tal? Hola, estoy bien. <laughs> Members of the jury, I am here to plea on behalf of opportunity. Do not let opportunity be put to death. Let him live and you will see that you will all survive this pandemic threat. You heard the arguments that were given by the prosecutor today that all is lost and all opportunities are gone, that the education sector will die and leave us to mourn. But the truth you must hear and the truth I must say. I am here today because I admit that yes, the world is in a crisis, but you must give opportunity the chance to make this all a mess. We must persist and we will find bliss amidst this global crisis. Hello everyone, thank you. I would like to thank the University of the West Indies for this opportunity where we can sit and discuss the prevalent issue of COVID-19 and how it has affected and impacted all of our lives. Today, I'll be talking about the education sector and how COVID-19 has impacted millions of students worldwide all across the globe. While there are many negative aspects we could look at and focus on when it comes to the education sector, like poor connectivity, um, students with our devices, we need to look at this from a different perspective. Like the glass analogy, instead of looking at the glass half empty, we can look at this glass as being half full. The education sector has been one of the sectors that has drastically been affected. Usually school would take place in a physical environment. It is one of the biggest congregations in the world. Millions, as I said, millions of students would go to school Monday to Friday throughout the week. And even on weekends, sometimes students go for lessons. So school has now moved from a physical space to a digital platform. And all education is now, the majority of education is 100% online. Students now have the opportunity to learn all about the world of technology as the world is gradually and continually moving towards a digital interface. We are now introduced to applications such as Zoom, Google Classroom, learning how to make a PowerPoint, not just for teachers, but students get to interact with these interfaces as well. As Bridget said earlier, students who learn better visually can benefit greatly from online school. So many students learn in different ways as teachers can now integrate wonderful diagrams and illustrations to students who are better seeing instead of just being a whiteboard and a classroom with a teacher talking, the teacher can now integrate these wonderful diagrams, illustrations and YouTube videos with the use of technology that improves learning in today's time. As well, right. So now we see more than ever, we are seeing many organizations that are seeing the importance of education during COVID-19. Many persons, many businesses and organizations have contributed to making sure students can learn despite not being present in a physical school. As a secondary school student, this makes me happy to see all the tons of support being received from the population as they help us to stay, to help us to stay sane during education and while we learn and also making sure that teachers, that teachers hard work does not go unnoticed during this time. 
Um, they are also helping us to stay on part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for Education that must be met before 2030. As I said before, let us not make sure the education sector die or mourn and these organizations, society, can help us to stay on part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for education, making sure that no child is left behind, making sure that everyone is included from around the world, making sure that everyone can prosper, everyone can take part and still be educated. There are many lessons we can all learn from COVID-19 and its impact on education. As we all see, life doesn't always go as we plan. Sometimes many of us would have planned, some people would have planned to go away for education to do different things. And one of these skills we are able to learn is being adapted. Even though we may not be physically, to go somewhere we can still go to other countries on a digital interface. So let's say we are students who may not have had the tuition to go to schools online. Let's say they wanted, physically I mean, let's say they wanted to go to university abroad. Now, looking at this crisis, the opportunity lies that the students can now from their home go to their dream school. One of the important questions, how can we deal with change? The only thing constant in life is change. None of us was expecting COVID-19, but it happened. And we were not given time to mentally prepare as it was very, as, as it was a very sudden shift in society. So this helps our ability to adapt when change comes around. Our students can worry. Some a lot of students are worrying right now, like this online schooling for me, I can't learn. But as I said before, we have to look at the opportunities. We have to look at this class as half full and not half empty. A positive attitude is necessary to making sure that students, the education sector, can move forward during this time, especially with the support from society. Education builds a country's human resources. Without education, there is no economy. It is important for training individuals to become the next prime minister, the next economist, the next teachers, doctors, lawyers. It, it is the core foundation of all society. And it trains youths and builds a better and our future generation. Students can learn despite not being in a physical space or so looking at the opportunities. So to end, ladies and gentlemen, let's take this opportunity to focus on how the education sector can emerge better than before. How can we rise from this crisis and make sure that no student is left behind, that all students can take advantages of the opportunities and resources? There are so many resources online that are now available to students. I see that there are teachers are now integrating online platforms like the Student Hub, and this gives me hope. This encourages students, and here what? No matter what happens, COVID-19 cannot stop us from learning. It cannot stop the education sector. So let us look at the opportunities in crisis. Crisis is opportunity. COVID-19, the way forward. So you see, I could go on and on about how opportunity has taught us to transform us. Albert Einstein rightly stated, in the midst of all crisis lies opportunity. Yes, members of the jury, do you see why it is necessary for opportunity to be free? It will not only benefit you and me, but members globally, we must all work in unity because crisis is indeed opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joshua, uh, for that presentation there, of course, on the education sector in Trinidad and Tobago. So guys, we've heard from all our panelists. We've gotten all their takes and all their insights, um, showing that, of course, young people are progressing quite well within our society and also have a very val valuable and valiant voice out there on key issues um, that impact us. So now I just want to, this is the part that, that I enjoy the most. Right, so we, we know that that all our all our um, panelists would have had their their presentations prepared, but for me, 
one of your most important and essential things is to have that very casual, what I, would, what I would call casual, moving away from as much formalities into a more casual setting and casual conversation, um, where I want to personally just ask you all questions and of course share questions with you all from the viewing audience as well, um, because you all, you all presented quite well, but now I have, to, I have some pressing questions that are, are top of mind almost immediately. And Bridget, I think I'm going to go to you first. You know, you focused a lot on the digitization aspect uh, within Trinidad and Tobago, and you spoke about digitization, digitizing rather so many different sectors within Trinidad and Tobago. But my question to you almost immediately is with a deficit financing budget, where exactly are we going to get the money to engage in all this digitization and, and to engage in all these technological advancements? Um, it's because I, I, I don't know. I don't know. So Bridget, maybe if you can share with us a little bit there your insight and your take on where this will come from or how, how we can go about doing this. Yes, thank you very much for that question. With our deficit and declining GDP, I think we can do one out of two things or a combination of them. One, we can either go to international, uh, international financial institutions like the IMF, which I know may be a, a controversial move, but we must keep pumping money into our economy if we hope to survive. Or we can either redirect, and I think that would be up to our policymakers and ministers of government and ministers of state to redirect resources from, um, from programs like the GATE program, which I thought should have been revised a little bit um, to get those money into digitalization. So, so both um, going to international monetary institutions and also redirection of our current um, revenue allocation policies. Just, just one follow-up question on that there, Bridget. Um, do you think that, that our own tech sector, the private sector here, has a role to play in, in that digitization process? Yes of, yes, of course they do. And I think our tech sector as well, when they um, now will need greater innovation in how they go about, the, um, go about doing these incremental shifts in order to bring about that technological progress. Great, thank you so much. And as we are on the topic of diversification, let me take a hop across now into the agriculture sector. Um, and let me let me uh, pitch my question off to who I would call the agri-man um, himself, right, uh, Esalon. So I wanna ask you, Esalon, you raised, you raised no, no, your presentation was was something that, um, that, that stuck out to me because you made some very bold statements inside there. Um, and one of the bold statements that you made is of course that, um, that agriculture has that stigma attached to it. Um, you know, and I, I don't know if I, if, I, if I fully agree 110% with that, I'm being completely honest with you here on that panel, um, because there are certain sectors within the, agricult within the agricultural realm, realm that of course um, have a different view and a different outlook on it as compared to other, other sectors and other parts of it as well. But nevertheless, let me pitch this question across to you. Um, just because generally there seems to be uh, some issues in terms of the view and the stigma attached to, to agriculture in your opinion. So how do you suggest the youth that want to get into farming of non-traditional crops, how do you suggest that they can source funding to start a, a business, um, especially in this current economic climate? And that comes out from our question, our question segment in, on Facebook there. So thank you to our Facebook viewing audience as well. That's an um, excellent question, as a matter of fact. And it's a conversation that we need to have. And I will say that we should um, definitely look into that um, allocation of that $500 million stimulus, where we can use some of that to help young entrepreneurs with the interest in agriculture. And I have some advice for those entrepreneurs um, who is interested in agriculture. Don't be in the shadows with your idea. Trinbago and by extension the Caribbean is flooded with opportunities and I think farming non-traditional crops is an excellent opportunity. However, I have um, also any agricultural entrepreneurs that you want to enter into the sector, you must have the mindset because agriculture is a commitment. You have to, you have to be committed to it because if you're not committed to it and you say, okay, I'm going to plant 500 beds of this and not water it and not being committed to it, it is going to die. So it means all that labor that you've invested is a waste of time. It's a commitment. 
And once you have the mindset, the sky is the limit. I think that answers the question. Thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, personally, I wanted to jump out and try and get into agriculture, but uh, Salon, don't go, don't go just yet. Don't go just yet. You have to come back here, Salon. I, I, I learn you off the hook so easy, man. Um, <laughs> So uh, again, another another um, question I want to pitch to you here. Since we're talking about that, since we're talking about all the issues that we see within the agriculture sector as well, of course, we know that the budget has just crossed $1 billion in allocation for um, agriculture, and that's the first time that has occurred and, and happened. Um, but but talk to me a little bit more now, because one of, one of the issues I see in terms of like if I want to jump out and get into agriculture is, of course, um, there seems to be this, this idea, or this concept as a walk in the park. Right, like if you could just you could just come out, you have the idea, you have the concept, and then you just enter into it, and it's a very smooth sailing ahead. But you raise issues around larceny, which continues to plague the agriculture sector in a massive way. That's one of the most most pertinent issues that we see occurring over and over. Um, but nevertheless, let me hear what what you think. What is the role of socialization and education in promoting more sustainable thinking as it relates to agriculture? Okay. And as I alluded earlier in promoting agriculture, we must first shift from, from that traditional thinking. Because I have noticed personally that in the light of COVID-19 and self-isolation, I believe that every household should adopt a considerable degree of self-sufficiency and food security, as this will develop the appreciation for, of agriculture. Because if you're not exposed to it, do you really think they'll appreciate it? We, that, that is something that we need to look at because not, not all youths will have an interest in agriculture, and that's fine. Other youths have interest in arts and culture. Other youths have interest in digital thinking. But agriculture, it seems to everybody, they, they're pushing the youths to agriculture, but not all youths love agriculture. And so those who love agriculture, kudos to you. But we need to bear in mind that not all youths love agriculture. Thank you so much, Asalon, for that. Um, and and uh, you know, again, we're sticking on that whole topic of, of um, diversification. And let me probably take a, a hop over to Joshua here um, and pitch a, pitch a question to Joshua. Um, because yes. now, we, now, we, now we're speaking about, about um, agri we, we just highlighted agriculture uh, and, and the importance of education inside there around that sector but also the importance of education around all other sectors, especially since we want to move towards uh, a movement towards, of course, um, equality and equity across across all planes. Um, now, Joshua, one of the things that, that, you, that you continuously raise is that there's a lot of opportunity out there. And that was, that was a constant record that you had in your presentation. Um, however, for me, one of the things that we've seen is that there are a lot of people who do not have equal opportunity across the board. So there are a lot of people who exist within poverty um, as well. So that, that there are people who exist with a certain level of privilege uh, because of their, their status, because of their social status, because of their class, because of their educational status, et cetera. Um, but for those people who do not have that, that equal opportunity, say equal access to technology, for example, how do we help them? How do we help, help those people who exist within poverty or who are marginalized? To, be, to, to reach to a level where they can share in, in equal opportunity with the rest of us who might exist in some level of privilege. Thank you for that question, Darren. So the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for Education. One of the goals is making sure that all students are included, inclusion and equality when it comes to education, making sure that all students around the world gets access to education, no matter their social status, who they are, race, color, it is important that we treat students equally as well. So that is why it is important for governments and organizations to be on par with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for Education and making sure that all students gain access, especially during this time when it comes to technology, because there are still students without devices, students without access to education. So it is extremely important that we make sure that these students are included as well, that they are treated equally and they are not looked upon because of their status in society. Thanks a lot for that, Joshua. Um, let, me, let me hop over now, guys, to Ambika. Um, and let's, let's talk a little bit about, about employment because education is one thing. So we've educated our, our young people. They have accomplished a lot. They have come out with their first class honors from the Department of Economics. 
right? Um, after being taught by, by Dr. St. Martin and Dr. Conrad, <laughs> and they are, they are out into the working world now. But one of the things that we continue to see is that, of course, youth unemployment and underemployment is at an all-time high within Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and that people come out with, with, with degrees but cannot find work in, in their various areas and, and spaces of study or places of study um, in the area of study. Um, and that, that continues to be a pressing, pressing issue. Um, so my question almost immediately, and, and to, just to give an example, to set that within context, there are a lot of people who are graduating with their law degrees and passing the bar, becoming um, lawyers, right, being called to the bar, but then have to settle to be paralegal, uh, you know, people working, working as a paralegal assistant or um, something along those lines, which then, then, then puts people who have studied paralegal studies, who have done their, their degree or their qualifications in paralegal studies, they then now have an, have an issue following that because then where do they fit in? What, what, what job do they enter into? So we see the ripple effects of all of these different things. But I'd wanna hear from you, Ambika, from your opinion. Um, how, how do you think we should solve the issue of youth unemployment and underemployment in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, that, that's a, a, a discussion I think we, we are be very honest. Because when we look at this now, people are going to get a degree in areas in which there are a lot of people who are already qualified and away from jobs. People, the youths especially, they aren't informed of the sectors in which there's a shortage of employees and they're going for more of the traditional jobs. They are moving away from, let's say, agriculture. As Lon spoke about this, it a wide and a very broad way and he also narrated them he spoke about it very well where he spoke that yes some people would go into it but some people need that extra push they need that that sort of they need to have that sort of encouragement and they aren't getting this when we look at it the government needs to put into place programs they need to put in place like certain institutions or whatnot where people can learn skills not only academics but rather skills in which you can actually go out and work into the world they don't have to be focused because books aren't for everyone. I think this is something that's wrong. Books aren't meant for everyone. Some people have skills, some people like to add, some people like to do agriculture and whatnot. Everybody is different in their own way. And we need to find a way to reach into the mindset of these youths and a system that's putting their interests out there into the youth. And you. another um, in addition to this, those people who would like to do something and they are financially able to do it. Okay, so I, I think we'll 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 um, double back and come back to Ambika a little bit later on. But let me let me just jump over to Dominique. Um, and and I did mention earlier that I do have a bias for this area, so I'm just putting that out there for the arts and culture sector. Um, nevertheless, I wanna I wanna pitch the question that came from our from our Facebook comments to you, um, Dominique, and that is, that is how do you think we can merge these new digital platforms to become part of our mainstream cultural presentations in a post-COVID Caribbean society so that they can be viable sources of income for the artists across our vast cultural sector? So that comes from our Facebook comments. Um, so basically what, what I see this asking, Dominique, Dominique, are you there with us? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, all right. So basically what I see this asking is, of course, how do the, how does, again, that whole idea of the digital coming to play in terms of being a, a valuable or a viable source of income for our artists who exist within the Caribbean region? What part do you see that playing? Um, well, to be honest, in my personal opinion, um, when you look at the art forms, like what artists and things do, um, in the Caribbean, in terms of artworks and stuff, we tend to stick to a more traditional route, meaning like um, pottery and um, paints and drawings and stuff. So we don't really tend to um, integrate technology into our art forms and artworks. But you could see clearly in um, international regions, there have been a lot of progression in terms of integrating technology with art. So to answer the question, it just simply boils down to if it is artists would be willing to take that step and 
integrate technology into what it is they're doing, probably um, expand the knowledge on where it is they know the technology to be, um, how it is they could see it influencing their artwork and art media. Yeah, and um, do you think do you think that that those structures uh, are in place to support that, to support artists actually moving inside there? Um, probably, probably not. I personally, I haven't thought of it that far. <laughs> I really haven't. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Um, guys, just just a reminder that we're actually on YouTube. But the YouTube link has been posted to, to Facebook. So YouTube is where the comments are coming in from. Um, so you all can, of course, check that out on YouTube and also share our link on all the social media platforms on Facebook, on um, Twitter, on, well, you can't really share on IG, but on all other um, platforms, feel free to share it and feel free to, to continue to tune in with us here on the YouTube platform as well. So I think we have time for probably just about um, two more questions and, uh, the, the, a question came in from our YouTube viewing audience for Joshua. And that question is, Joshua, to you is, um, does the current education system prepare the workforce for innovation in the COVID environment? Does the current education system prepare the workforce for innovation in the COVID environment? Well, a lot of people would have different opinions on this, but I think it is necessary that students learn in different ways. Some students may not appreciate online school. They would prefer physical learning as there would be some barriers to communication happening. However, other students may find this more convenient. So in terms of preparing students for the world of work, it boils down to the student and how he or she learns, finding new ways to adapt, finding new ways to be able to learn during this time, making use of resources. And I think, there are lots of resources being provided this time, and a lot of teachers in the Ministry of Education is also working on new resources, such like um, education channels on television, um, access to YouTube, and these different platforms that provide different types of education for students during this time to make sure that students can still learn, students can still be prepared for the world of working and adapt different, adopt different skills like innovation, et cetera. Thank you, Joshua. And um, I think what, what I wanna do now is, is probably throw the last question from our viewing audience, from our YouTube audience, which I think is a very important question and one that I alluded to quite uh, a little bit earlier, but um, it's, <laughs> And I think our viewing audience member who submitted this question summed it up uh, quite nicely. And this is a general question open to any of our panelists. Um, where are we getting the money from to do all of these, <laughs> all of these things that you all have suggested and that you all have put forth? So in your opinion, where are we getting, where the money coming from? That's the question that I ask, where it coming from, right? Where, where are we getting it from? We're in a deficit financing budget right now. You know, they, 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 they're not predicting much economic growth on a global scale or on a local scale in the, in the next coming year or so. So um, where, where, the, where the money going to come from? What are, what are some of the ideas that you all have there? So that's, that's the last question I'm going to ask. And I think it is quite a, quite a, um, a good question as well. They're summed up in, in Lehman's terms, yeah? So to any one of our panelists. Um, if no one else on, may I interject? Sure, sure, Bridget, go ahead. Yeah, um, as I said before, I think it would, we would have to up to the IMF and up to the World Bank and all these institutions in order to get funding. Um, but also too, I think it serves as a mechanism for the innovation of our citizenry because we have citizens that their, our capacity for creativity and innovation is untouchable, I think. And I think once we are able to use this time to develop new markets, new niche products, we should be fine. And we should generate from infant industries once they, um, once, I mean, it's a barrier even to start a um, business at this time, but once we figure out the loopholes just to get that initiating agent, I think we have strong potential, the unification of our human 
of our human capabilities and our interconnectivity within ourselves as citizenry and the regionally will serve as a mechanism to get that funded. Thank you for that, Bridget. Now that's that's one one area of economic thought. People, some people say, all right, we need to go to the IMF. But I wanna I wanna ask again to the panel if there if there are any opposing views to that because I'm always a, 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 a an individual who likes to get a multiplicity of views and, and opinions on on different um different ways forward, Bridget. So I'm not saying that I disagree or agree with your with your stance, but I wanna hear if, if any of our other panelists have has a has another idea or another way forward. Or if you all agree, you all can come on board and agree as well with Bridget. So that's not an issue. Um, actually, in addition to what Bridget would have said, I believe that within the economy here, there is a substantial amount of finances circulating. And there is a lot of money that, that still needs to be collected from taxes, from corporate taxes and whatnot. And if the country, if the government is able to get this money from large companies and whatnot they would be able to gain a substantial amount invested back into the economy so that in the long term we would be able to come out of our deficit and hopefully move into a surplus an interesting take there as well i like it i like it do we have any other opinions i i, I would i think i would i would like to, to to hear if we have any other opinions on this before i move into asking you all to of course offer your last um remarks or, or last thoughts before we prepare to wrap up. Um, are you guys hearing me? Yes. Okay, I would like to say that how we should look at borrowing from the public as opposed to going to international financial institutions. Okay? Um, because <clears throat> there are consequences associated with going to um, international lending institutions, because we all know that um, I'm not, I, I don't want to be bold again, but the IMF is not very lenient people, right? Um, so we should look at borrowing from the, um, the citizenry in terms of <clears throat> issuing bond securities. Yes, it will increase our um, domestic debt, but at the same time, we will get that funding. And it's something that we could settle it in our um, geographical confines rather than put into international confines. So that's my take on that. Thank you so and, much. And, and to add to with the uncertainty going up, going um, that circulating, I do believe that um, the minister was quite confident when he um, said that oil and gas will be um, at US $45 and $3. Um, but given the uncertainty in the market, there is a, a possibility of that fiscal deficit rising. There is the possibility because the market is very uncertain. And if that rises, it means the fiscal deficit is going to rise. So that's something we should look at. Thank you so much, Asul. And guys, we, you see, and this is the beauty with economics. Uh, this is why I love this study so much because you can, you can pitch one question and get several different answers across the board. And of course, no answer is wrong and no answer is right. Right, um, there's a lot to be explored inside there as well. And, and being a, a student of cultural studies, my master's in cultural studies, culture also plays a big part in where, where what method can be successful because what could work for, for, the, for the Europeans or for the um, Africans or for the Asians might not work here within the Caribbean region as well. So it's important that we also take that into consideration. Um, I will refrain from sharing my own my own opinion or my own take on the on the <laughs> on the IMF and, and how do we um, finance deficit finance um, and how do we get out of that as well. But rather, I will take a comment from one of our viewing members again, uh, and it says in term in terms of where the money is coming from. I totally disagree with IMF. As Caribbean countries, we need to find more efficient ways to use our resources and our limited resources. It may force us out of our comfort zone, but it's an opportunity to become more self-reliant. So that's interesting there. And of course, I, I think that this person will be um, speaking, especially after taking into consideration uh, situations in Jamaica, um, situations in Barbados, etc. So nevertheless, uh, this has been an exciting discussion. It's been it's been amazing. It's been um, quite fantastic. And I want to I want to now, of course, offer our panelists the opportunity to give us their closing remarks, their um, remaining thoughts, 
that it would like to push into, of course, summing it up into two minutes each, if you all could uh, keep it within that time frame. But I want to give you all the opportunity to do so now, uh, maybe starting with our first panelist, who was Bridget. So in summary and conclusion, um, I just like to say thank you all again for having me. And I think now with current the coronavirus pandemic, it has presented an opportunity for us to be more creative, more innovative, more interconnected. And um, it would, we now can turn to financial technology, education system reformation, and all these opportunities that we would not have been able to do if we didn't have the pandemic. So we have to look at those little um, little, little victories, little wins, even in a mess that we currently are in. Um, so yeah, and you know, the systematic changes that we can implement would have never arose if it wasn't for this time. So it really is an opportunity in crisis. Um, with regards to our the our food importation and our food um food bill it shows that now because we were so reliant on our importation on importation that we can now become more um resilient in the way in which we feed our citizenry and how we can actually um have better practices moving forward and i look forward to seeing how the various sectors do so and i'm hopeful to see our economy after the pandemic, because we will recover. It's just a matter of how we will moving forward. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, maybe we can go over to, to Esalon now. Okay. okay, so in closing, um, I would like to see the initiatives that were discussed here be implemented. And you know what COVID-19 has shown us? COVID-19 has shown us that necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, I heard this from Dr. Conrad. And if I'm saying it wrong, I beg that he corrects me. Um, where vulnerability becomes the norm, resilience must become the imperative. I'm not sure if I said it correct, doctor, but you can correct me if it's wrong. Um, I look forward to an exciting process as we embark on agricultural success. That's what I'm looking forward to. I look forward to seeing the youths be active in this sector because diversification really starts from the youths. And that's my take on that. Thank you, Esteban. Um, let's keep it moving and head over to Ambika for her final thoughts. So I'd like to thank um, you for having us here today. And on taking the economy and whatnot, I have a force. Post COVID 19, I would really like to see the agricultural sector develop. I would like to see it like this. I would like to see innovative ideas to grow in the country because now we have a chance for entrepreneurship to take place and sort of chapter, of course, towards diversification of the economy. And this is what I would like to really see to all of the groups of credit because at the end of the day, we are the future. We are the way of moving to the forward to become a role on the international map and not just to kind of but rather for fruits, for vegetables, for produce. Thank you, Ambika. Um, let's move over to your colleague from SWA as well, uh, Dominique. Uh, um, for my closing remarks, I'd like to thank everyone for having us here, um, first of all. And personally, I would like to see the arts and culture sector um, continue to grow in terms of creativity and innovation. And I I'm quite curious as to see how far it is um, the Caribbean would be um, in terms of taking it further. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dominique. And uh, um, last, by, but by no means least, Joshua. So and I would just like to say thank you very much to the University of the West so for the University of the West Indies. Conversations like these are important, getting youths involved because youth voices are extremely important. So I wanna thank you guys very much for this conversation that was able to happen today. And we need to remember that we need moving forward, we need to continue working together 
to make sure that we rise from this crisis, that all students can be provided basic necessities and that education sector can move forward despite this crisis. Let us all remember that we are all in this together. United we stand, divided we fall. So let us overcome this and moving forward, keep working, keep striving for excellence, not only in the education sector, but in life in general. So thank you. Thank you, Joshua. And I wanna take this opportunity to say thank you to all our panelists, some very interesting and intriguing points coming to the forefront, but of course, the most important one and the consistent theme that we have seen is that of diversification. So that has been repeating itself over and over and over within our discussions. Um, so I, I would just like to take, take this opportunity now to uh, hand over to Joel, who will close us off for this afternoon's proceedings. And I would like to say thank you as well to the Department of Economics in, at the University of the West Indies um, for having me here as a moderator. My name is Darian Ryan, and I am signing off and uh, handing over to, uh, to of course, um, Joel. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it has been, it is my privilege um, to be asked to do this vote of thanks for this occasion. Um, I would really like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all who have attended this court youth armchair discussion and contributed to all of the discussions that we had today. I would like to thank um, the head of Department of Economics, Dr. Darren Conrad, for always supporting and encouraging youth activities, especially the court youth events. Um, I'd like to really thank our moderator, Mr. Darian Narain, for a really phenomenal job he has done this afternoon in terms of encouraging the discussion and really engaging our, our participants. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters, Ms. Bridget Gopal and, Ms., and Mr. Eslon Dumont, the undergraduate representatives from UV St. Augustine, Ms. Ambika Parvatu and Ms. Dominique Laurent from Swaha Hindu College, and Mr. Jo Joshua Pegas of Queens Royal College. It is with deep, it was, it is with a deep sense of gratitude that I also extend my thanks to the Coast Youth Events Subcommittee. That would be Dr. Roxanne Brazantin Martin, Ms. Ayana Alain from Bishop's High School, Tobago, Mr. Wend Wendell Long from Presentation College, Shagwanas, Ms. Arada Bagalu from La Lachmi Girls Hindu College. Ms. Rene Lewis, Ms. Require Scott, and Dina Subdio of the Economics Society of UE. Um, I would also like to, um, this opportunity to place on thanks um, people who provided technical and logistical support for this event. Ms. Wendy Maynard, Ms. Chanel Glasgow, and David as well, and all of the staff at the office of marketing and communications. Um, I'd like to thank Sidrina Carr, um, the Secretariat at the Department of Economics, especially Mr. Rennie Lopez and Mr. Guy and Victor. Um, I cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to take, take on this task and make sure it was a complete success. Um, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we want to say that we are most grateful that um, you joined us this afternoon, and it has been a pleasure having you, all right? Um, we just want you to look out for the upcoming court events, which is the CO 2020 Youth Knockoff Debate Competition. Um, on Thursday the 29th, we have, that, we have the competition from one to four. Um, we will be posting up information on our Facebook page, and of course, via email as well. And, um, sending out information to all of the teachers in the secondary schools and to our quote final debate competition on the 12th of November. We have over um, $15,000 in prizes to give out for, for that particular competition and we are very excited about it. Thank you so very much from the Department of Economics and have a good and safe and productive day. Bye.
Okay, everyone in live stream.